Growing new brain cells literally sounds like something that would only happen in like Star Trek or some weird space movie, but it is a very, very real thing. And neurogenesis is what it's called. So neurogenesis is real. It's the formation of new brain cells. And unlike the rest of our body, even as we age, we can grow new brain cells. This isn't entirely true for muscle and other areas of the body, or at least as much. And it all comes down to something called BDNF. Now, BDNF is brain-derived neurotropic factor, and that word, that term gets thrown around all the time in like over-marketed hype. But there are five actual ways that you can increase BDNF and directly and indirectly increase neurogenesis. Now, how we understand this whole process in the first place came from really early on rodent model research where they took a look at rodents that had strokes and they found that when BDNF increased, it improved their neurogenesis and they regained motor function. So we know that BDNF, at least in rodents, directly impacts neurogenesis. But now we have human data that really makes some sense. So let's go ahead and jump right into the first one. Don't get discouraged because I know it sounds blanket and vague, but I have very specific things. It's exercise, but hear me out because there's two different forms that are very unique. The first study was published in Experimental Physiology. Okay, it was really interesting. They took a look at subjects that did four hours of rowing. Now, during this four hour rowing experiment, they were literally doing blood samples while they were rowing. What they found is that BDNF doubled in these humans during their rowing exercise, and 70 to 80% of it was produced in the brain directly. So what that is implying is that literally while we're doing lower intensity, steady state work, we're doubling the production. So potentially the longer that we do like zone two work, the more BDNF we get. So it might be more advantageous for you to do like zone two, lower heart rate intensity work for longer periods of time, maybe just a couple times per week. But then when we look at the rodent model data to kind of interface with this, we find that there was a three to five X increase in the mRNA expression of BDNF in the hippocampal region. What that tells us is that it's predominantly happening in the hippocampus, which is what's associated with memory and things like that, working memory, spatial memory. What does that mean for you as a human? It means that you might literally feel like your memory is better, your recall is better, you generally feel better if you do longer bouts of lower intensity cardio. But what about high intensity work? We do know that that has a role, but it's not always sustainable. So with this, we look at a study that was published in neuroendocrinology. This was really fascinating because it looked at resistance training, but it looked at BFR training. I know I'm biased because I am a huge blood flow restriction training fan. I, I find major, major benefits in it across the board. But what they did is they had subjects do a 40% intensity resistance training workout, or they had them do a 40% intensity blood flow restriction training workout where they put uh, BFR cuffs on them, okay? Or they had them do 80% intensity non-BFR work. What they found is that all the exercise groups had increases in BDNF, okay? That's no shock. But the 40% intensity BFR group had significantly higher BDNF scores than the 40% non-BFR group. So much so that it was almost as much as the 80% high intensity group. What does this mean? It means if you do BFR, if you use BFR cuffs, you can literally train at a lower intensity, which is arguably more sustainable, and get the same impact on neurogenesis, BDNF, that you would if you were training at a high intensity, taxing your body all the time. This is one of the biggest reasons why I love to do BFR training before I film. My brain is lit up. I used to think it's placebo, maybe it still is, but now at least I understand why it might be working. Now this next one might ruffle some feathers because it's semi-controversial, but periodic carbohydrate restriction. Now, what's going on here? With this, we look at a study that took a look at only 12 people. It's relatively small, but these 12 people had metabolic syndrome. Okay, and what they did is they had them go on a lower carb paleo style diet, not even crazy low carb. They had them do this diet alone or diet plus high intensity training. So high intensity interval training, excuse me. What they found with this is that the diet alone increased BDNF by 20%. But when they did the diet plus the exercise, it increased BDNF 38%. That's above control that wasn't doing a low carb diet. Why could this be the case? The best explanation is that when the carbohydrates are restricted, 
you're sort of mimicking a fasting effect. And when you're fasting, you flip sort of this metabolic switch that allows additional calcium influx into the cell that triggers this downstream effect of enzymes and kinases that ultimately increases BDNF. The other way is that by restricting carbohydrates, you're potentially producing ketones, which have an impact on BDNF as well. Does it mean you need to do it all the time? No, here's my advice to you. Periodically take a few weeks and restrict carbohydrates maybe below 15 or 20%. Do some exercise along with it, see how your brain feels, and you can do it as sort of a maintenance system on your brain. You don't have to adopt that lifestyle entirely. You can use it as a tool, and that's where people get really confused. I also put a link down below for Thrive Market, which is a 30% off discount link for all groceries through Thrive Market. I mentioned this because maybe you wanna just periodically do low carb, it makes it easy to shop for groceries and low carb. So that way you go onto their website and you can sort by diet type, by low carb or keto, and you can load up on a bunch of groceries, you can load up on meat and seafood and all kinds of things that fit in that category. But honestly, the best part is the price. 30% off your entire first grocery order, plus a free gift when you use that link down below. But ongoing, like Thrive Market makes it super easy. Everything's delivered to your doorstep. You don't have to go to the grocery store. It saves you money, it saves you time. It's convenient. All the food that's there is already in the better for you category. So it's just stuff that I would approve of. Anyhow, that link is down below, top line of the description below this video. This next one, you have to hear me out on this because if you are someone that deals with bad sleep, there's a way that you can counteract the negative effects of poor sleep. You can reverse it. But with this, we have to understand how this affects the brain. So sleep deprivation leads to a decrease in BDNF, arguably a decrease in brain cells, because BDNF helps maintain too. Now, that being said, it's less about the sleep and more about the stress that comes with the lack of sleep. So when you have lack of sleep, you have more oxidative stress, and that's damaging to the brain. Okay, well, that's easy enough. Sleep more. Easier said than done, right? So with this, we look at another paper that teaches us how to counteract it. This study was published in Frontiers in Psychology, and it found that meditation practices for just a few minutes per day, get this, can increase BDNF levels almost as much as exercise. Okay, what does that have to do with sleep? We can also see that meditation practices for like 10 minutes on days that you didn't sleep well, just a little bit of meditation can sort of override some of the negative aspects of the bad sleep. So you didn't sleep good, you only got five hours of sleep, try taking 10 or 15 minutes to meditate and you might be able to reverse the potential negative aspects of the poor sleep on BDNF. Now, in addition to that, if you take 10 minutes to practice some mindfulness or meditation on days you do sleep well, you probably get an additive benefit on brain cells. This next one is one of the most fascinating things that I've seen. It's the effect of sunlight on BDNF and potential neurogenesis. Now this study was published in Neural Regenerative Research. It was rodent model, but it was still interesting. They had rodents do 30 minute bouts of exercise five times per week for four weeks. Or they had them do 30 minute bouts of light exposure five times per week for four weeks. The light exposure triggered just as much BDNF as the exercise. What this tells us is that not exercise is better or light is better, but being outside and getting sunlight is going to hugely increase BDNF. It's almost like we're plants in a way. It's like our brain just responds to that. We get more BDNF out of it. Is it the fact that it feels good to be in the sun? Maybe. Is there literally like a photobiomodulation effect of the sunlight hitting our body? Possibly, probably a little combination of both. But if we know that exercise increases BDNF and we know that sunlight increases BDNF, what happens if you, I don't know, exercise outside, right? See where I'm going with this. So it's all about kind of combining these little things. But what's the last one? Well, the next one is less about, well, the next one is more about what you don't do. Okay, now this is about not eating occasionally, occasionally fasting. And I know I'm the fasting guy, so at the risk of sounding biased, I understand. But the data is still fairly strong. Now with this, we look at a study that was published in Brain Sciences. And this one is a rodent model study, but if we understand the mechanisms, it makes some sense. They had rats intermittent fast for 12 weeks. Now what they found is that the rats that did the intermittent fasting ended up having significant increases in BDNF in both type two diabetic rats and control rats. Why is that so important? 
Well, it's not that uncommon in a diabetic or unhealthy situation to have fasting improve markers because you're ultimately restricting calories, you're putting them on a healthier lifestyle, and they were unhealthy before, so they're getting healthier, so things improve. But when you see equal increases in type 2 diabetic rats and control rats, that tells us a lot. That tells us that it's not less about the reversal of their metabolic issues, it's more about what is this additive benefit that they're getting. They also found that there were less anxiety symptoms in the rats that intermittent fasted, which is also associated with more BDNF. Now once again, just like when you restrict carbohydrates, when you restrict fuel in general, you flip this metabolic switch that sort of tips the cascade of benefits into a completely different direction. So now you have more of a situation where calcium influx goes into the cell, and then you have more of these enzymes and kinases that trigger BDNF expression. Also, fasting is going to trigger more ketones. Ketones impact what is called histone deacetylase inhibition. What this is, is histone deacetylase inhibition basically means that you're allowing genes to express more. If ketones are not sort of unlocking this gene expression, then BDNF does not increase as much. So although it's speculating and somewhat mechanistic, it doesn't hurt to occasionally say, I'm gonna take 12 hours away from food, or I'm going to do a 20 hour fast one day a week or two days per week. The dose does make the poison. The longer the fast, probably the stronger the benefit with this, up to about 48 hours. So maybe you should consider doing, I don't know, a 24 hour fast once every two weeks or so, or a 48 hour fast once a month, something like that. It doesn't have to be a lifestyle, it's more a tool. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.